Hello, everyone, and welcome to the first event of Students for Responsible Policies in Yemen, <laughs> featuring Professors Nina Tannenwald and Stephen Kinzer. I'd like to thank the Watson Institute, the International Relations Program, the Middle East Studies Program, and the Middle East Studies Doug for their support in making this event happen. At the end of the event, we hope that many of you will stay um, for the Brown Journal of World Affairs release party, which will have free food and free journals and will begin at 745 here. This evening's conversation is entitled The War on Terror in Yemen and Beyond, Legal and Ethical Implications. Professor Tannenwald is the Director of International Relations here at Brown, a senior lecturer in the Department of Political Science and a faculty fellow at the Watson Institute. She is the author of The Nuclear Taboo, the United States and the Non-Use of Nuclear Weapons Since 1945, which won the Lep Gold Prize for Best Book in International Relations in 2009. She is engaged in research on targeted killing, the laws of war, and other questions of political science and international relations. Professor Kinzer is a senior fellow in international and public affairs at the Watson Institute. His most recent book, The Brothers, John Foster Dulles, Alan Dulles, and Their Secret World War, was a Kirkus Review's best nonfiction book of 2013. He also published an article just a few days ago in the Boston Globe that I encourage everyone here to read called U.S. Plunges into War with Yemen. His research focuses on anti-imperialism in America and on current events and challenges in Southwest Asia. Um, without further ado, please join me in welcoming Professor, Tin uh, Professor Tannewald. Thank you very much, Ben. Uh, this is being recorded for posterity, so we, we have to use the mics here. Um, I want to thank Ben for organizing this. Uh, he first started organizing it way back in last spring, I think, or sometime in the summer, uh, which was very prescient because uh, it's really now that this, uh, this issue has, has uh, sort of risen above the radar screen for the average reader, in, in part because of this bombing on October 8th of, of uh, a big uh, a funeral, a, a big um, well, sort of a wedding party, essentially. Uh, but uh, we're, we're at war in Yemen. Uh, the United States is at war in Yemen, and this is a war that nobody is talking about because there are two other wars that overshadow it. So what, what we want to do here today is, uh, Ben asked me to talk about legal and ethical implications of the U.S. involvement in this war, and uh, then uh, my colleague here is going to talk about uh, some of the larger context of U.S. foreign policy in the Middle East region. So we're each going to talk about 15 or 20 minutes, and then we'll open it up for discussion. <clears throat> so basically what's going on here is that uh, Saudi Arabia is at war with Yemen, uh, and the United States is uh, supplying uh, a significant amount of arms. So military aircraft, uh, refueling uh, capabilities, uh, bombs of various kinds, cluster bombs, 2,000-pound uh, huge, huge bombs. Uh, the United States has become quite involved in this war, and not only by supplying weapons, but also providing logistical and intelligence information for targeting. The war has had devastating humanitarian consequences. So uh, it's been going on now since uh, March uh, 2015, and it's Probably 10,000 people have been killed, uh, many of them, most of them civilians. Uh, about uh, 900,000 people are displaced, have been displaced within Yemen. And about 80% of the population is in need of a humanitarian assistance. And uh, so this is now becoming a humanitarian catastrophe. And the question is, what is the U.S. responsibility here? What is the U.S. In terms of ethics, what is the U.S. responsibility? And in terms of the law, uh, what are the U U.S. legal obligations? Uh, so before we get into that, let's start with a, a primary question. Who knows where Yemen is? <laughs> a few people. All right. Let's see. Fortunately, I brought a map or two. All right. You see where Yemen is, right? A little down there south of Saudi Arabia. Uh, and Whoops, I have to get my technology here. All right, so this is from March 2016. I mean, already these uh, areas are not totally accurate, but basically what's going on in Yemen is a 
a competition, a war between, a civil war between two governments. So the, the Houthi rebellion from the, from the left here, from the north, um, fighting against uh, the Saudi-supported, essentially legitimate president of, of Yemen, Hadi. Uh, but there are other actors involved here. For some, Yemen's a very tribal society, but Al-Qaeda is present. So uh, the, uh, I guess it's the pink areas are Al-Qaeda, and the uh, blue areas, which are kind of small on this map, are uh, Islamic State is now there. Uh, and the green areas are uh, the areas controlled by the elected, sort of elected government, uh, the government supported by Saudi Arabia and therefore by the United States. And the, uh, the brown area to the left there is the Houthi rebel supported area. Let me just say a few words about the, the background here. Whoops, this conflict. Oh, let me try this. Can I? Forget it. Well, that's, a, that's a YouTube. We're going to skip that. Uh, so just uh, some quick chronology on the conflict. Right, so it began, there's a, uh, an insurgency by the, the Houthis, who are um, a, a, a Shia sect, the Zaidi Shia sect. Right, there's been an insurrection uh, since 2004. Then they, they overthrew uh, the President uh, Saleh in, in November 2011. Uh, he had been the longtime dictator. He was replaced with President Hadi. Uh, and, uh, and then in September uh, 2014, the war began when the, the Houthis basically t took over the capital of Yemen, Sana'a. And they eventually uh, chased Hadi out. And uh, he went to Aden, and then he went into exile. In, uh, so it, as the Houthis pushed down to, to, to Aden, then the Saudis became very concerned. And so basically in March 2015, Saudi Arabia went to war with a coalition of eight other Arab states. It's the Gulf, most of the Gulf Cooperation Council. It is supported logistically by the US, France, and Britain. So with wep weaponry and with logistical and intelligence support. Uh, this, uh, now we've, this war has gone on. Uh, since that time, uh, largely under the radar screen of the international community. So uh, this was the most recent big uh, strike uh, hitting the funeral home. And a funeral, a large funeral, 140 people were killed in this. Uh, and this has now led to uh, a, a lot more scrutiny of what's going on, including by members of Congress. So uh, let's raise some of the issues here. First are the ethical issues, right? What is, what is the U.S. responsibility? Is the U.S. directly fighting? Okay, the U.S. itself is not dropping bombs. But the U.S. is supplying much of the weaponry, and it's also providing targeting information and assistance. And so uh, if the weapons are being used directly on civilians, that's a violation, those are war crimes. And targeting assistance also uh, is potentially, those are potentially war crimes. But we can actually, these are really actually legal issues as well. And there's a number of legal issues here. So uh, the first is the issue of war crimes, which is the direct targeting of civilians. And this, these are war crimes under the Geneva Conventions, under the laws of war. A second issue is, is the use of cluster bombs. So uh, Saudi Arabia has been using cluster bombs. There is a convention against uh, prohibiting the use of cluster bombs that was uh, adopted in 2008. 118 countries have signed the cluster bomb convention. The United States has not. Saudi Arabia has not. Yemen has not. Uh, I should say the United States has not joined the treaty. It has signed it, which means it has a legal obligation not to undermine it. U.S. policy is that we can't sell cluster bombs to any country where we suspect they might be used in a populated area. And uh, Human Rights Watch uh, released a report last February on cluster bomb usage in the Yemen war. And basically these bombs are... Uh, 
many of them are manufactured in the United States. This actually has a very local connection. I'm going to jump ahead here a little bit. So the last maker of cluster bombs in the United States is the Textron Corporation, which is based in downtown Providence. So there were protests all last spring out in front of Textron over these bombs. The, uh, the Obama administration, so that when Human Rights Watch released its report in February 2016, this then drew quite a lot of attention to what was going on in Yemen. Uh, and the Obama administration in May, at the end of May, blocked the delivery of 400 uh, cluster bomb munitions to Saudi Arabia, uh, concerned about what was happening. In the beginning of September, Textron announced they would no longer be producing cluster bombs. So uh, de citing declining international orders and increased scrutiny. So here's a case in this, what is, what is overall a very depressing story. Uh, there's actually, there is actually some progress and, and these kinds of things show how the fact that uh, cluster bombs are, have become stigmatized and this company decides they can't really do business in this area anymore show how the law, even when the United States has not signed it, can have a spillover effect, right, by stigmatizing countries who are using this, these kinds of weapons. So, uh, so that was an, uh, an important shift. Uh, the, more, the larger issue with weapons, I'm going to back up a little here, uh, is arms sales uh, to Saudi Arabia. And here the legal framework is the arms trade treaty. So this is an international convention that was adopted in 2014, and it tries to regulate uh, the arms trade. And uh, the United States, once again, is not a signatory of this treaty. Uh, it's not party to this treaty. Uh, but again, it, it has signed it. And basically, the arms trade treaty, it's, it has human rights provisions in it, so it basically says, you can't sell weapons to countries that are going to commit human rights abuses with weapons, right? You, if, you sus if you suspect that countries are going to use these against their civilian population, you can't sell weapons. So there is significant evidence that, in fact, Saudi Arabia is using U.S. supplied weapons against civilians. Now, again, there is another key a report by Human Rights Watch, again, put this on the international agenda. So in, in March uh, 2016, there was a bombing of a market in Yemen in which 97 people were killed. Uh, a market, of course, a civilian target. Human Rights Watch people who were on the ground went in and found pieces that they identified as uh, U.S. made 2,000-pound bombs. 2,000-pound bombs are huge. Right? So the United States, when it drops bombs, tends to drop 500-pound bombs because 2,000-pound bomb bombs are enormous and create a lot of collateral damage. They kill a lot of people in a wide area. So the fact that the Saudis are using these 2,000-pound bombs supplied by the United States, right? first we gave it to them and second they're using it. So this caused uh, an international uproar when this Human Rights Watch report came out on this. And this, this is really began the moment when people started scrutinizing what's going on in Saudi Arabia uh, and what the US role is. The final issue here, uh, oops, am I going backwards or forwards? Let's see. Here's some statistics on the Saudi arms sale. So the Saudi Arabia was the largest purchaser of arms in 2015, the year single year 2015. So if you're looking at a five-year average, India is the largest purchaser of arms, but, in this, but, it, but Saudi Arabia replaced India in the year 2015. And they've had a, Saudi Arabia has had a gigantic increase in arms purchases since 2011, right, which is since when the, the, the rebellion began to really heat up. Um, these are all the countries that sell to Saudi Arabia, so it's the US and all our European friends. Uh, all kinds of weapons. This is just showing various European countries and Canada that uh, sell 
all kinds of, of aircraft, bombs, weapons, and so on. So it's a big, big, big industry. Drones. All right, one more topic. Drones. So there's been a drone war going on in Yemen. This is the other kind of ethical, legal issue. So Dr Yemen is one of the sites where the U.S., uh, the CIA, in this case, has been carrying out drone strikes with the consent of the Yemen government. These are the predator drones that are used. Uh, and, and, and so here's the questions about drones, right? Is it legal? Are, drones, are the use of drones legal under international law? Is it ethical, right, to, there's the, the ethical issue, if you could take out one person and prevent, thereby prevent uh, many others from being killed. For example, your soldiers, right, instead of having to send in a combat, a, a commando contingent, you could just use a drone. Is that ethically correct? And second, does it work, right? Does it actually work targeting terrorists, which is basically what the US says we're doing? Does it work? These uh, are statistics on the drone strikes in Yemen compiled by the Bureau of Investigative Journalism, which is the uh, a, a British NGO that follows drone, drone strikes. So uh, the Obama administration released this, this spring uh, a statement. It's finally trying to engage in some transparency, a statement about how many people it thought had, had been killed in drone strikes. Uh, and most people thought that their numbers were wildly low, wildly low. So there's different, some different NGOs that try to do the counting. It's very, very difficult. The evidence, the sources are extremely difficult. So there's lots and lots of uncertainty here. So you should take these as, as ballpark numbers. But it just gives you a sense of, of how many strikes uh, and, and the numbers of people and the numbers of civilians uh, killed in these strikes, which is quite high. And sometimes, What's an interesting way to think about this is sometimes they've, they've got a particular terrorist in mind, Al-Qaeda, uh, mostly these have been Al-Qaeda targets in Yemen, um, and they keep going after that person, right, until they get him. But in the course of a bunch of strikes, 10 or 12 strikes, and when they finally get this guy, they've killed 150 civilians. So each single strike will have some collateral damage of three or 10 civilians, which doesn't seem like a lot, but then you add it all up, right, for the number of times, right? There's this, this time factor in there that's, that's uh, interesting. And these are other kinds of strikes. So we've been engaged in other, other various other strikes in, in Yemen too, for example, with cruise missiles. So it's not, not all with drones. Uh, I mean, my own take on drones, to, to give you the two bits, is that uh, they're not illegal. And I'm not entirely opposed to drones. So when they're used in Afghanistan or in Iraq, where there's an actual declared battlefield, uh, they're legal. And there they're used, it's the Defense Department that's carrying out the drone strikes. In many cases, they are less damaging than the alternative, right? The alternative might be a combat force, it might be a cruise missile, it might be just a bomb you drop. Uh, and the, the reason they're better is because drones can hover. They can hover over the target for a long, long time and, and strike when they think the time is right. They do make mistakes, so, so there are a lot of civilians killed. Um, the real, the legal problem comes with the global battlefield and where drones are being used by the CIA, which is not the military, uh, in Pakistan, in Yemen, in Somalia, uh, that creates a slippery slope effect, right, where you open the door to Somebody to Russia saying, oh, why can't we use drones to take out drug dealers in Chicago? Right? Why not? So um, there's discussions about you know, how effective they are and whether they increase anti-Americanism and, and, uh, and create more terrorists and so on. So the question for you guys is, um, why is the US supporting Saudi Arabia? Why is the U.S. doing this? Are they? This is going to segue into Stephen's talk, but yes. Backed by Iran, so if we have to choose between the two, we are allied with Saudi Arabia. So, like an indirect support of a government that we don't necessarily agree with is like a more direct 
like disagreement with Iran? Yeah, I think that uh, that would be sort of my view. I think this is payback for the Iran agreement, right? So Saudi Arabia really, really opposed the Iran agreement, and this is payback time. This is keep the Saudis happy, keep them from complaining too much. This is you know what we sort of owe them. They're our allies. We're going to support them. But I think there's you know deeply problematic issues here. All right, I'll stop there. I always get called on when it's, it ends with deeply problematic <laughs> issues. I don't know why. Uh, well, it's great to be here, and I congratulate Ben and those that have focused on this issue before the rest of the world, or rest of America has, which is even today is before the rest of America has focused on it. And it says something good about Brown and I think the Watson Institute that we're here tonight. So it's a, it's a wonderful achievement, and I congratulate those that have uh, tried to draw attention to some uh, developments in the world that, according to our press and our political leaders, are not worthy of scrutiny. Um, so we really are at war now in Yemen. Um, you saw all the statistics about uh, what has happened with our drone attacks in which hundreds of uh, Yemenis have been killed. Um, and we have, as you just heard quite graphically, been supplying weapons and actionable intelligence to the Saudi bombing force. Uh, but just in the last few weeks, the United States has become directly involved. So for the first time, uh, missiles fired from an American warship have landed in Yemen. Uh, there was an attack on an American warship. It uh, was unsuccessful. The missiles fell into the sea. Nonetheless, um, it was calculated that that weapon, th those missiles came from uh, Houthi-controlled areas. We were, the Pentagon later admitted that they couldn't decide, couldn't determine who actually fired it. It, it. They figured out it was from an area controlled by the Houthis. Now, somebody that wanted to draw uh, the United States into this conflict would have had plenty of reason to set up a missile uh, launcher in that area and fire it. So it's still obscure, like so much about this war. Um, the most obscure part of the war um, is the way we became involved. So there used to be a time when, if the United States went to war, the president would tell us why. There'd be a speech. There'd be some kind of a statement, an explanation. Then, you're, none of you, a few of you are old enough to remember this, but we used to have a thing called de declaration of war. <laughs> In the old days, when we obeyed that old constitutional stricture, we couldn't go to war unless we declared war. And the Constitution specifically assigns the US Congress the responsibility of declaring war. We haven't declared war in, in the lifetime of most of the people in this room, but we're, we are at war. So that raises a serious political and constitutional question. Uh, so I want to talk a little bit about the background, uh, how, how this all happened. Uh, first has to do with our relationship with Saudi Arabia. It goes all the way back to uh, 1945 when uh, Franklin Roosevelt secretly met with the king of Saudi Arabia on his way home from the Yalta Conference. They met on a battleship in uh, the Suez Canal, and they settled on the deal that America would protect Saudi Arabia. Meanwhile, Saudi Arabia would send oil to the United States. Some years later, uh, an American uh, asked the king, why did you choose the United States to ally with? Why didn't you decide to go with France or Britain or some other country? And he had a great answer. He said, because you are very far away. <laughs> um, so our relationship with Saudi Arabia has built steadily since then. Uh, for many years, uh, the center of social and political action in Washington was the Saudi embassy. Uh, Prince Bandar, the uh, Saudi ambassador, was a flamboyant figure. The Saudis have contributed to the favorite charity of every American president and every American first lady. They have contributed millions to the construction of every presidential library, um, even presented a set of jewels to uh, Nancy Reagan that she had made into a beautiful tiara. So there's a deep intimacy between Saudi Arabia and the United States. It's based a lot on money. So we needed the oil, and they needed weapons. Um, it was back in the era of the oil shock when suddenly we were spending billions and tens of billions of dollars on oil that uh, actually Henry Kissinger went to leaders in the Middle East and explained to them, 
you're sucking a huge amount of money out of our treasury, which is okay because we need the oil, but you've got to send that money back into the United States somehow. So figure out something you'd like to buy in the United States that costs tens of billions of dollars. And that was a quick uh, co computation, a quick calculation. They decided weapons was uh, what they wanted. And weapons actually is one of the very few things that America still makes better than anyone in the world. So uh, we're a great supplier. Um, the arms industry has become a principal bulwark of the U.S.-Saudi relationship. Um, and the arms industry is hugely powerful in Washington. Um, every time um, the Congress votes for a large weapons program, the contractor immediately divides up the project into many sub-projects and then figures out the districts of influential members of Congress and influential senators and places those subcontracts with companies in the districts uh, of those influential representatives. That makes it naturally very difficult to oppose projects even when members of Congress come to realize that they're wasteful. They have to stand up and say, this weapon is wasteful, it shouldn't be made, and therefore I want a thousand people in my district to be thrown out of work. It's a very difficult statement for any member of Congress to make. So the arms industry has that uh, weapon, and then in addition, naturally, it's a large contributor to political campaigns. So uh, Saudi Arabia, being such a huge consumer of our most advanced, most sophisticated, and most expensive weapons, automatically gets put on the list of countries that we want to stay on good terms with. Um, I do think there are other outside actors that are pushing the Americans towards this conflict. Um, I think the Israelis like the idea that uh, uh, any forces that they perceive as connected to Iran are being crushed. And Iran itself is, of course, a driver of this. What you effectively have in Yemen is a, a war between two governments, both claiming to be the legitimate government. Um, and it has become very much a proxy war. Uh, it's the kind of war that Saudi Arabia spent most of its life as a nation avoiding. Saudi Arabia has traditionally been a very conservative country, does not engage in, in military adventures. And I venture to guess that if the king of Saudi Arabia had not died a couple of years ago, and a uh, young prince taken, had not taken over the reins of power, uh, we, we would not be seeing this war. This war would not be being fought now. Um, the Iran factor uh, plays into another American trope. Uh, often when you see the Houthis mentioned, we always use the phrase, the Iran-backed Houthis. That's always a signal that that's the bad side. Um, it's true the Houthis are, they're not 12 or Shiites like the Shiites in uh, Iran, but they are a Shia-related sect, um, and that's enough for Saudi Arabia. So they decided that uh, the Houthi uh, rebellion or military campaign was not domestically motivated. It didn't have to do with affairs just within Yemen. It was actually a drive by Iran for power in the Persian Gulf, which, they, which the Saudis see as part of an Iranian drive for power in various other parts of that greater region. So Yemen has the great misfortune of being the theater, just being the stage on which an outside conflict is being played out. It's not so much about Yemen as it is about what the Saudis think of Iran and what the Iranians think of Saudi Arabia. I do believe that Iranian aid to the Houthis is way overstated. We haven't seen any real evidence that there's anything approaching uh, the amount of aid that the Saudis are given, giving to their side. Nonetheless, there's certainly some connection. There's certainly some sympathy. Presumably, there's some material aid as well. So this is enough to motivate us. Uh, the anti-Iran sentiment in Washington nearly 40 years after the hostage crisis is still intense. It's become an institution of American foreign policy. So uh, telling people that we're fighting against an Iran-backed group is really all you need in Washington, particularly when you have the uh, <coughs> strength of the arms industry uh, behind it. Um, now. The uh, recent events, particularly the bombing of the funeral, have caused what I would characterize as a ripple of concern in Washington. Uh, some senators didn't like it. They thought it was a little bit excessive. It drew their attention to something that they weren't as smart as Ben to notice had been happening up to now. Uh, I would actually, just since we're talking about that funeral uh, event, have a somewhat different take. So the Saudis explained it later by saying they got bad information. That may be true. We'll probably never find out 
the real answer, but there could be another answer. That was a funeral for uh, somebody connected to the Houthi leadership. Therefore, many prominent people in that movement would be there. So I can imagine them sitting around in uh, Riyadh saying, why don't we bomb it? We can kill a whole bunch of them at once. And somebody would say, yeah, but the outside world won't like it. And uh, this, uh, guys will say, well, so we'll apologize. And I think uh, that's an old tradition in warfare. Uh, you know that you are going to get criticized for something, so you just announce, you just uh, fix your mind in advance that when trouble comes, we'll apologize and say it was bad advice. Uh, but the, there are some larger factors at work here, and one of them is the ability of our partners. And I want to make clear, Saudi Arabia is a partner of ours. It's not an ally. There is a difference. We have no treaty obligation to defend Saudi Arabia. But our partners can drag us into conflicts by their own political decisions. They enter conflicts based on calculations of their own national interest. They may be right, they may be wrong. But they don't enter conflicts based on their calculation of our national interest. They drag us in. So here is a, here is a case of that where uh, a partner of ours has decided it needs to fight this war, and we've kind of tra tagged along behind. This is a dangerous phenomenon that we see elsewhere. Um, I, we, were, we saw it recently in Turkey. So Turkey shot down a Russian airplane. Suppose the Russia had retaliated and shot down a Turkish airplane. Turkey, as a member of NATO, would come to the United States and say, we're being attacked. You have to come in because of our decision that we want to be fighting in Syria and Russia is there, suddenly you've got to find yourself at war with Russia. Um, we are finding this also in the interesting situation that's developing in the Philippines. So the president of the Philippines, as some of you may have read, has suddenly turned up in China, and he's thinking that um, maybe he wants to change his uh, relationship from being a subsidiary state of the United States to being more independent. So the, we, ha we do have a defense treaty with the Philippines. Uh, if the Philippines decides on its own to become more confrontational and more involved militarily against one of its neighbors, we then get pulled into that. So this is a danger for us to look for. Uh, you want to choose partners that are not going to drag you into conflicts that may be in their benefit but are not in your own. Uh, and even if your partners want to do that, you should stop and think before being pulled in, which I don't think we did uh, when we entered the conflict in Saudi, uh, Saudi Arabia and in, uh, in Yemen. Uh, this conflict also gives the United States another reason to remain militarily powerful and have a great military presence in the whole Persian Gulf region. Uh, this uh, is a project that was originally uh, declared to be part of U.S. policy by President Jimmy Carter in the Carter Doctrine of 1980. I brought a couple of sentences from that. Uh, he's talking about the region, the Persian Gulf itself. It contain, this region contains more than two-thirds of the world's <coughs> exportable oil. The Soviet effort to dominate Afghanistan has brought Soviet military forces within 300 miles of the Indian Ocean and close to the Straits of Hormuz, a, that's in the Persian Gulf, a waterway through which most of the world's oil must flow. The Soviet Union is now attempting to consolidate a strategic position that poses a grave threat to the free movement of Middle East oil. Let our position be absolutely clear. This is the Carter Doctrine now. An attempt by any outside force to gain control of the Persian Gulf region will be regarded as an assault on the vital interests of the United States of America, and such an assault will be repelled by any means necessary, including military force. Now, Carter explains in this statement, written by Zbigniew Brzezinski, that we have two reasons to want to patrol the Persian Gulf. One is, most of our oil is coming from there. And the other is, the Soviet Union is in the neighborhood and threatens to become a major strategic force there. Well, there's no more Soviet Union, and we are not receiving most of our oil from the Persian Gulf anymore. This reflects another larger problem that has uh, afflicted American foreign policy, and that is that it's, it changes so slowly. It's so immobile. We have great policies for an era that's over, but we don't change our policies as the world changes. History teaches us that countries and empires that last for a long time uh, are the ones that are agile, that can ride the currents of history. And American foreign policy is the opposite. It's like one of those giant oil tankers that you turn the wheel and it takes two days before it starts turning around. In our case, it takes years and decades. So 
we shaped our, we're now involved in the Persian Gulf based on criteria that no longer apply. Um, we should be looking for ways to pull ourselves, to extract ourselves out of the Persian Gulf region. The reasons that brought us there may have made sense at the time. They don't make sense anymore. There's no reason for the United States to be the ultimate policeman of the Persian Gulf. We do it in large measure because it is a part of our policy of wanting to be the policeman of every Gulf and every other body of water and most other pieces of land in the world. So it's an outgrowth of a larger view that if there's conflict anywhere in the world, the United States should be there. And we have to pick a side. By entering the Yemen civil war, we just picked up a couple of million new enemies in uh, the Muslim world, which was something we really didn't need. Um, we have t taken on a project that principally benefits Saudi Arabia, at least by its own calculus, and probably also has the effect of benefiting Al-Qaeda, because the recruiting possibilities there and the upheaval in that region serve to portray the United States exactly the way Al-Qaeda likes to portray us, as always looking for another Muslim country that we could bomb. So at a moment when Americans are hoping we could pull ourselves away from some of the military conflicts that have pulled us into the greater Middle East, we've now just entered another one. I sense that there is a little bit of concern about this in Washington, but I don't think it's enough to change policy. I also believe that with the coming of the new administration, we will see a, a generally more <laughs> aggressive uh, military posture. We're going to go in the opposite direction from the one I've recommended. We will not be reducing our footprint in the Persian Gulf region or in the Gulf itself. Um, I believe we will probably continue to support Saudi Arabia in a military project that isolates us in the region, aligns us with forces that are increasingly uh, isolated from the world, and that's what's happening with Saudi Arabia, and actually undermines the national interests of the United States. We have no vital interest in who wins the Yemen civil war. It, the outcome of that war may affect some countries in that region, but it does not affect our security directly or even indirectly. We, we more thoroughly undermine our security by intensifying our involvement in that war than we would from withdrawing. That is a pro proposition that would be very unpopular in Washington, and that's why I think this conflict, unfortunately, will continue at its present level, if not escalate. Thank you. Um, thank you both very much. Um, we'll take a few minutes now um, for our speakers to answer your questions, um, and, and then we'll conclude. Um, so if anyone has any questions. So you said something about um, how like we have an institute, kind of almost an institutionalized like this deep dislike of Iran, yeah. and basically like a lot of things that we do is kind of a knee jerk re reaction to Iran. So I am I'm like I, so I don't really know a lot of the foreign policy like history behind it. So I'm like very curious as to why we are we have designated Iran as like the second Soviet Union because it seems like it's, like it has never been a great power. Like it just. Does it make sense to you? Well, in your, you, you're feigning ignorance, but actually showing great uh, insight by asking that question. Uh, it, it, it's, it's something that we wrestle with. I have a friend in Washington who's been a correspondent there for probably almost as long as I've been alive. He's been there since forever. And I, so he's very much into the Washington merry-go-round. And I asked him, so why is it? Why is the Iran fanaticism so intense? And without hesitating a moment, he said, it all goes back to the hostage crisis. Don't forget that the people now at the, of the generation that are running our country are the people who grew up with the uh, hostage crisis. And for those of you who didn't live through it, it's hard to imagine how searing and how humiliating it was. Uh, from there, uh, we went on to take sides in Iran's war against Iraq. Uh, we decided to side with Saddam Hussein because we hated Iran so much. Um, 
we supplied helicopters to Saddam, we supplied intelligence uh, information to him, and we even, President Reagan sent a special envoy to go and visit Saddam and ask him, what can we do for you? And that envoy was none other than Donald Rumsfeld. Uh, so our hostility to Iran has been almost unbroken during that period. And here's what I think is the oddest part of it. Actually, the strategic interests of Iran align with the strategic interests of the United States much more closely than the strategic interests of Saudi Arabia align with the interests of the United States. So uh, we have had several moments when it looked like we might be able to overcome this, particularly in the period after 9-11. Uh, the Afghan, the uh, Iranians were very helpful in connecting us to Afghan forces. Uh, they were the ones who uh, helped us put the man we wanted, Hamid Karzai, in as president of Afghanistan. Uh, and many Iranians thought this was now the moment when we were going to break out of the isolation and the hostility. But as just as this process was beginning, George Bush made his famous speech lumping Iran in with uh, Iraq and North Korea two of the most brutal dictatorships in the world, as an axis of evil. We later found out from the speechwriter in his famous interview with Vanity Fair that at the beginning of the speech, Iran wasn't in the axis of evil. Uh, but somebody said to him, you know, two is not an axis. You need three. So they said, oh, well, uh, let's see. How about Iran? Uh, and at the last minute, uh, one of Bush's aides actually went to him and said, you know, do you, you sure you want to keep Iran in? And he said, yes, I do. Uh, so that's how it became part of the axis of evil. But let me conclude by pointing out what I said about strategic interests. I want to make that point clear. So uh, I believe if we have one strategic interest in that part of the world, it is to counter the ideology represented by al-Qaeda and ISIS and related groups. Uh, now, those groups want to kill every Iranian because they're Shia. Those groups consider the Shia worse than any Hindu or Buddhist or Christian or Jew. That is their reason for a living. So th do you think this gives Iran a pretty good reason to be anti-Al-Qaeda, anti-ISIS? They have much more reason to hate Al-Qaeda even than we do. That is the basis for a potential uh, arrangement, not necessarily a partnership, but we should be working together with them on what I believe should be our principal project in the Middle East and what is certainly the principal project for Iran. The Iranian security establishment believes they really have, other than environmental concerns, only one real existential threat, and that's it, the al-Qaeda-ISIS ideology. I would like to think that we also consider that a threat. That's a basis for a partnership. There are many other bases, but we could start with that. It would require us to pull back and look more seriously at our vital interests, and it would require us to do something that I mentioned earlier as something very difficult for us, which is to look at our foreign policies and say, you know, some of that worked for another time, but times have changed and we should change with them. That's something we don't do very well. Can I just add to that? So one of the criticisms of the Iran agreement was that it basically legitimized Iran, right? It sort of normalized Iran and uh, legitimized its position as a regional power. I mean, regardless of what you thought about whether it would constrain Iran's nuclear program, simply the fact of having this agreement right, legitimized the Iranian government. Uh, and so if you hold that view, then it's important in this view to signal to Iran that you know, they cannot expand their power all over the Middle East, because the, the concern is that, well, if they're we treat them as a legitimate government, now we've taken the constraints off them, the sanctions and so on, and now they can go around and make trouble all over the Middle East, and they're doing it by supporting these, these, these Houthi insurgents. Uh, and so it's very important to demonstrate, I mean, this is an argument in Washington, to push back against what we see as Iranian efforts to meddle in various areas of the Middle East. And so it's, it's, there's a little bit of, it's not quite the domino effect, but the idea that, that you, have to, you have to demonstrate that you're going to stand up, you've got resolve, you're going to stand up against um, Iranian incursions into various places. Now, I, I agree with Stephen, I think the Iranian support for the Houthis is overstated. 
Um, I mean, Saudi Arabia is sort of in a panic over Iran, but uh, this is a view that's very prominent in Washington. And because the Iran agreement is the signature foreign policy success of the Obama administration, it's very, very important to protect that agreement. And so, therefore, it is important to uh, kind of placate the conservative critics of the agreement domestically and also internationally. And those are the, they're the domestic conservative critics and, and critics abroad like Saudi Arabia and Israel by helping them in what they are concerned about, right? There's a, they have a sh the conservative critics here and Saudi Arabia and Israel have a shared view that Iran is this implacable uh, power monger in the Middle East and is going to make a lot of mischief. And so it's important to push back against it. So that's partly where that, on top of what Stephen said, where that this, this, this involvement comes from. Yes, OK. Please. Um, uh, I, of course, uh, we had to read one of your works on the Japan world on stigmatizing the bomb, the nuclear... I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, anyways, um, as you just did in the lecture, you um, really <coughs> stated the power of, you know, public opinion in influencing public policy, which then, you know, led to nu um, nuclear testing bans and arms control, right? Um, but then, of course, Professor Kinzer just laid out this um, sort of bleak future where... Uh, we can't really influence how the American foreign policy is going to act out in the Middle East. Um, how much power do you think um, public opinion still has on influencing American foreign policy going into the future um, in the face of all these you know, um, arms contractors and dealers having so much power in Congress and um, generally the presidency not really adhering to Congress's powers of declaring war? So that's a great question. And uh, I don't know if I have a satisfying answer. Uh, I have some answer, but so, I mean, public opinion can have an impact, and you can already see several areas where, uh, you know, public criticism of what's going on in Saudi Arabia can make the U.S. administration very uncomfortable, right? So uh, the first, w so the first thing is the banning of the, prohibiting the cluster bombs. I mean, that's a concrete effect of people protesting. Um, second is, in August, the Obama administration announced a 1.15 billion arms sale to Saudi Arabia of tanks, Abram tanks. These are like our best tanks. Uh, and 60 members of Congress wrote a letter saying that we ought to scrutinize the sale a bit more before delivering it. Now, this is, you know, it's only 60 members, but that's not nothing, right? And these things can build. Uh, then you have weakened, it's, I mean, public opinion also can be reflected in things like the, the UN Human Rights Council, which has now taken a look at this. So you could, we can see a shift from last year to this year. So September 2015, there was a Dutch proposal to the UN Human Rights Council to um, send an inquiry, a human right, basically investigate the, all the war crimes in, in Saudi Arabia. And it was blocked by, guess who? By Britain and the United States, uh, very discreetly and deftly. But uh, they were protecting Saudi Arabia. They're also protecting their arms deals. Same resolution came up this year. Uh, and this time, it, uh, Arab states also blocked it, but um, the, the, a watered-down, I would say, a watered-down resolution was adopted. So instead of the full-scale inquiry that the human rights organizations might have wanted, it's going to be kind of a piggybacking on a Yemen, Yemeni national inquiry. Okay, so it's, it's not ideal, but this time the U.S. and the U.K., uh, did not block this. They actually supported it. So here you, you can see a shift. I agree, it's too slow, right? It's too slow for what's needed. Uh, there's now elections to the UN Human Rights Council on Friday. Uh, this creates, has created a fantastic opportunity for human rights groups to write all these reports about how Saudi Arabia, which is running unopposed uh, for the Middle East uh, slate, seat um, should not be elected to the Human Rights Council. And so you can use this as a political moment to highlight all these problems. Now, will it have concrete effect? I think we could make the U.S. government very uncomfortable. I think Stephen's right. 
the future president <clears throat> is probably going to be a bit more warlike than Obama. Um, but 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 I think the if we're to have hope of of increased scrutiny of this kind of stuff or even blocking it, the only place it is going to come from is public movements, is civil society movements. If civil society does nothing, nothing will happen. I used to work with uh, famous journalist Seymour Hirsch, and uh, he had a standard speech about how America was going to hell and our policies were all wrong. And at the end of the speech, there would often be the first question, something like, oh, you're so right, I agree with you, so what can we do? And he used to like to lean into the microphone and say, nothing. <laughs> I don't believe that. I really don't. I, I feel that uh, we already have the m makings of uh, some counter uh, narrative, including what's coming right out of this room. Um, we have, from the WikiLeaks trove, a cable from Secretary of State Hillary Clinton that says we know most of the money that is supporting radical Islamic Salafists and jihadists all across the Middle East and beyond is coming from Saudi Arabia. She, she wrote that, so she knows this. It can't be that she's in the dark about this all. So I do think that uh, despite all these other factors uh, and powerful forces, uh, some less powerful voices should emerge. If we don't try, then, we're, then public opinion will definitely have no impact. So I think that given this situation and the confluence of circumstances inside the United States, not only can public opinion have an impact, this really is a moment when uh, we can grab on to some public discontent, congressional discontent, international discontent, and try to change the narrative around this conflict. Um, in the back. the cluster bombs, and his response about the U.S. involvement in Saudi Arabia was that Saudi Arabia is in a conflict with Yemen, and they're going to be in that conflict with Yemen. If we stay engaged with them, giving them resources for war and, and intelligence, we have some control over what they do. If we withdraw that, they will get that from somebody else, so we, uh, Russia or someone. How do you answer that? I don't like that argument because what it says is that uh, our complicity actually has a positive side to it. Um, I don't think you could sell that to a lot of Yemenis. Uh, it's true, we cannot control what our partners do, but as I want to go back to something I said earlier. When they do things that we're not even involved with, we become implicated. So you have to balance this. I, I feel that there are, that this argument is not always wrong. But in this case, the extremity of the Saudi campaign is such that I really think it merits a, a deep second look by the United States. Yeah, I want to second that. Um, I mean, they think there are two arguments coming from the government, from people in the Pentagon, and, and Reid is basically just parroting that, right? Which is one that when we give them all these weapons, we then participate, uh, influence, and even, they don't say, but basically participate in the decision making, right? So the weapons we give them are incredibly complex. They require a lot of maintenance, right? I mean, we have advisors all over the place, and we give them a lot of targeting information. So we're essentially helping them make decisions. I mean, that's the argument, right? Uh, and if we weren't there, maybe they would make worse decisions. It's sort of hard to see that. But, uh, and the second argument is that if we didn't supply them with all these smart weapons, because we do have the greatest weapons, somebody else would supply them with worse weapons, and then there would be even more collateral damage. Right? So I'm not sure I buy that argument either. I think it's a bit gen disingenuous. So there's, a, there's actually an article um, that just came out in the, it's a military blog called War on the Rocks, which actually goes into this question of whether the United States really has any, this argument about, well, when we're there, we influence their decision making, says that's really a crock -a, right? Yes, we have some influence, but they're making lots of decisions without us, right? Despite of the fact that all our, our people are there. And I think, that, I think the ethical issues are really big here to say, well, we have to supply weapons because somebody else will supply worse ones. I mean, that, that seems to me a lot of, uh, 
dissembling, I would say. Uh, so I, I, I think I, that, that's not so persuasive to me. But I mean, there's a, we have such a huge arms industry, right? I mean, we depend on the Saudis to buy stuff from us. I mean, if the Saudis stopped buying stuff from us, our arms industry would be in, in, a, in, in bad shape. Richard, go ahead. You've been in the room for a lot of these decisions. Uh, Richard Boucher was the State Department spokesman many years. Well, I was also the State Department spokesman when the USS Cole was blown up in Korea. Mm. Yeah. Wow. Mm -hmm. I think you actually have to go deeper than just going, you got the Al Qaeda. <laughs> but you got their way. And <coughs> we've been involved in this place since before the Saudis intervened, since before the Civil War broke out. Since before since 2002, the first drone strike was. Yeah. And that was because of Al Qaeda, because of the people who attacked the Twin Towers. And at that time, we saw them as the danger, and we knew they inhabited ungoverned space, you might say, yeah. whether it was the tribal areas of Pakistan or parts most of Afghanistan at the time, and other places. And so we saw this as ungoverned space, we saw this as a dangerous place. And Yemen's always been an unstable government. Uh, ever since they drove the British out in the 60s, it's been, you know, the president drives the vice president out of town, and then, you know, and then the vice president, you know, then they cut a deal to come back, and then the vice president drives the president out of town. Uh, it's always been this amalgamated state that never has quite been stable, but has managed to survive for a while, and now it's erupted in open violence. But the fundamental reason the United States is there is it goes way beyond arms and oil. It's ungoverned space where terrorists are operating. And in some sense, you could say the Saudis are supporting a legitimate government, mm -hmm. trying to reestablish authority in a place that's dangerous. We're there. We're in, we're in uh, Aden because of uh, terrorists in, in that part of Yemen. We're in Djibouti, when Somalia. All these places are ungoverned spaces where Al Qaeda is operating. Now, whether we're dealing with it well or not, is a whole other discussion, and I tend to agree with you on a lot of things you said on that. But I think that fundamental issue for us is not oil and arms, the fundamental issue is okay. Well, let me ask you this, if it's allowed for the person on the panel to ask a question to someone in the audience. Um, we went in there in part because we feared Al-Qaeda and that phenomenon. Do you think that our present policy is still is achieving that goal, or might it be achieving the opposite goal? I mean, so that's a great question. I mean, the, so there, you're right that there, there are two kind of, let's say, two conflicts going on here. The, the Al-Qaeda one goes back to 2002, right? That goes way back. So drones, U.S. drone strikes have been going, have been going on in Yemen with the permission of the government since 2002. That's, that is in some ways entirely separate from the Saudi you know, the, the, the civil war between two governments in Saudi Arabia. I mean, Al-Qaeda has been a little bit involved, but, um, but that's, that's a different conflict. So now we're, you know, the drone strikes are still going on against Al-Qaeda targets, but now we're, you know, we're basically complicit in the Saudi war, in the, in the Saudis' support for the legitimate government. But it seems to me if the concern is that this is an ungoverned space and we're trying to bring order to it, that this is absolutely the wrong way to do it, right? That, I mean, basically all the analysis says that this place is more of a mess than ever, and more people hate the United States than ever. That doesn't seem like quite the unique. outcome that you want. <laughs> In the back, please. Um, so you both touched upon the fact that this is been a proxy war between Saudi Arabia and Iran. I was wondering also to what extent it's the conclusion to the, I don't really know that much about it, but the unification of Yemen in the 90s, um, because from this map it looks like it's effectively the borders between North and South Yemen. Yeah. <laughs> I don't remember at all. 
I mean, sort of yes. Well, it's true. So there have been internal conflicts in Yemen. As, as Richard pointed out, Yemen has never been Switzerland. Um, nonetheless, it's a tribal society, and our insertion of our own power into there, as I think uh, you just heard, in many cases intensifies these rivalries. I go back to something that I said earlier, that uh, had there not been a change of regime in Saudi Arabia, we would still be involved in the projects that we were brought into by the USS Cole and by Al-Qaeda and by ungoverned space, but it wouldn't be anything like this. So there's been a real change uh, in our involvement in Yemen because there's been a big change in Saudi Arabia's involvement, not because of any decision that we made based on our own security. Like the Saudis are doing this and that, and we never, when we when we talk about military decisions, we never um, speak about it from the perspective of like hobby or the legitimate government. And so, kind of, my question, I guess, is: is the legit, is the legitimate or the supposedly legitimate government? Are they the people actually making these military calls, or is it just the Saudi government, kind of with a blanket consent from hobby and his people? Well, I don't sense that the hobby group has much influence over Saudi Arabia. I think without Saudi Arabia, they wouldn't be in power. So they are not going to rebel or criticize or suggest anything uh, to the Saudis. I, I, I mean, that might be stretching it just a bit, but only a bit. Yeah, I think Saudi Arabia is in charge. I mean, they have all the military, right? I mean, Yemen doesn't really have any military. They have complete air superiority. They have, you know, they're in control. Um, so it turns out, like, the last time we declared war is in 1942. Yes, correct. Um, so... I think it was in 1941, but... Yeah, uh, yeah. The end so, of 1941, yeah. So, like, I, um, so, so would you, so, but you said that U.S. is based just about officially at war in, uh, in Yemen. And I am kind of confused. Are we, like, flagrantly violating our constitution, or, like... Or violating? not flagrantly, just moderately? <laughs> Well, first of all, as you point out, it's not a new idea that the United States goes to war without declaring war. We never declared war in Vietnam, and we haven't declared war in Iraq or in Afghanistan. Um, this is the new way of war. And uh, what you are not seeing now in Washington is angry congressmen outraged that they've not been asked and that the president is going off on these ventures by himself. Believe me, they're completely complicit. The president would actually love to get a declaration of war from Congress, but they don't want to be involved. If you vote yes, then things are going to go badly, and then you're going to get blamed for it. If you vote for no, you look like you're not supporting your country. So Congress is completely complicit in this. It's not that they're being run roughshod over. Uh, it, it's an agreement that it's an arrangement that suits everybody, and except for our long dead framers. Like, this seems like the perfect... But who would impeach them? Because the members of Congress are on the same side. They all agree that, look, that they want to ignore that clause of the Constitution. What's wrong with declaring war? So, I, I For the, it's the reason I just mentioned. You can't... Both votes, yes and no, are fraught with danger. And congressmen don't like anything that's fraught with danger. So I could note that Congress just passed a law saying that U.S. citizens can sue Saudi Arabia for 9-11. Uh, over the object strong, strong objections of Saudi Arabia and the Obama administration. Who knows? Maybe somebody will wind up suing us. Yeah. But a, a footnote on that. The president has asked Congress for authority to fight ISIS, and Congress has refused to give it to him. So in this case, the president's asked for a declaration of on the ISIS question, and it's the Congress and particularly the Senate that have said, no, we're not going to do that. So, is, is there like a particular political ramifications of declar official declarations? Is there like a reason why they're avoiding official declarations? Taking so, responsibility. Sharing so them. there are two things going on. One is the issue of taking responsibility, and, and one is 
the declining legitimacy of aggressive war. So war became, aggressive war became illegal with the UN Charter, right? So you can go to war in self-defense. So any war that you fight has to somehow be framed as self-defense. And because of the declining legitimacy of war, it's become unfashionable to actually declare war. No upstanding civilized country relishes the thought of going to war the way we did in World War I. And so, I mean, it's really, it's, it's unfashionable to declare war. Everyone does it with, you know, you don't want, you don't want to announce that you're going to war. You, you go to war. And if you're pressed, you say, well, it was our legitimate self-defense. Unfortunately, the Constitution doesn't have the word fashionable versus unfashionable, <laughs> so it's a little hard to get around. the conflict in terms of fighting an Iran back through and like considering the rhetoric that's come from both of our current presidential candidates on that issue, how do you think this is going to play out in the next administration in terms of other more prominent in a way Iran back groups such as like Hezbollah who is currently like massed over 150,000 rockets on the border of northern Israel for just an example. Um, and like they have a much more very concrete structure and very legitimate role to play in Lebanon as a whole. So how do you think the next presidency would just, you know, adhere to that same ideology of fighting an Iran-backed group elsewhere? Well, I want to go back to what, what Anina said. I think there's a, going to be a, a stronger view from the White House now than ever that Iran is an expansionist power. They're trying to influence countries all around their region. There's going to be a Shiite crescent stretching all the way from uh, Afghanistan through to the Gulf and beyond. Uh, if you believe that, and if you believe that expanding Iranian power is, uh, by definition, bad for the United States, you get into this process of containment, as we had with the Soviet Union. You don't want to stop them everywhere. And then you begin seeing them maybe even in places where they're not so powerful. So. Uh, one of the principal motivations for continuing this project, I agree, is uh, it's just part of our global strategy to contain Iran. Um, so throughout this talk, the Hadi government has been referred to as the legitimate government. And obviously, before this conflict started, it was. Um, but Hadi fled to Aden, and then I think on the timeline it said went into exile. Um, so why is it still deemed? The legitimate government, which I guess kind of relates to the question of why are we supporting the Saudis in this? You, you could make a case for either one of the sides as the legitimate government. Now, one of them is holding the capital, so we normally use that one, but um, one was driven from power by, they could argue, an outside force. Uh, who's the real legitimate gover uh, government of Yemen is uh, even a more difficult question to answer now than it has been in the past. I mean, last... Sometime last year, the, the UN Security Council, which has been very, very weak on, on this issue, passed a resolution basically calling for, a, calling for the Houthis to put down their arms and uh, observe a ceasefire and basically criticize them, uh, the focus was on the Houthis, as, as you know, a, rebel, a, a rebellious force. Uh, they haven't passed any resolution on that recently. I think it's even harder now to determine who is really the legitimate government. But at least a year ago, there was more of a consensus that the Hadi government was, was the legitimate government. And I suspect you know, it has become more difficult to determine that. Unofficial declaration of war. <laughs> and, and, like, so, is that, would that be considered under like the UN Charter or like whatever this international organization? Would that be considered a crime against humanity? Like just going to or backing, like doing a, this unofficial war for a non obvious self defense reasons? Well, it's an interesting question because, in a way, as, as Nita pointed out, we, we found a neat way to get around the prohibition on aggressive by just not declaring it. So we have one, we just don't call it one. And uh, framers of the UN uh, Charter didn't really foresee that possibility. So uh, I think we have found a way to observe the letter of our international obligation uh, while uh, ignoring the spirit. I mean, well, I mean, let me say this. I mean, there's two legal frameworks here. One is the US Constitution and the War Powers Act, and the other is what the UN Charter permits. So. 
The UN Charter permits under Article 51 that states can use force in self-defense. So, so the Hadi government can legitimately say we're so you know we have an insurrection and they're trying to overthrow us, and countries can legitimately ask for outside assistance. So third parties can intervene. So they can ask Saudi Arabia for help, and Saudi Arabia can ask us for help, right? So uh, none of that is illegal. Arms sales are not per se illegal, right? You can sell all the arms you want to anybody you want. Now we have this new arms trade treaty which puts some human rights restrictions on it. Uh, but in principle, helping other countries fight wars is not per se illegal in general. That is in, in, by international standard. Yeah. Whether it's legal, whether what we're doing is legal or not under the U.S. Constitution, right. there's a separate question. Right, right. Can we take one more question? Yes. Over the course of your lifetimes and mine, there's been the, the massive growth of the military industrial complex. The war on terror is their dream because it's unending. To what degree does that commercial interest in unending war drive policy and how has that changed? I believe it plays a major role. I believe it's, a, it's an important role. Um, we, we are seemingly entering into an age of permanent war. Some of the young people in this room can't remember a time when the United States was not at war. And there doesn't seem to be any prospect of it ending. So look at, uh, as lawyers like to say, qui bono, who benefits? Is it really the security interests of the United States? If I look for a material uh, beneficiary, I think uh, the... It's not just the, the arms industry and the entire security complex that has grown so massive that it really uh, out, uh, has outgrown the United States government itself has become a kind of a permanent force quietly in guiding our national policy and uh, it's really one of the most profound developments of our, our modern of our lives that this whole new force has emerged largely out of view. And it seems impermeable to outside uh, criticism. So I think our goal has to be to try through uh, those levers that we can push, which have to do with elections and politics and Congress, uh, to try to right that balance a little bit. I mean, I, I, think, I think this is, you know, it's facilitated by a belief system, though, an ideology that the United States is the indispensable nation, and, and Stephen alluded to this earlier, that we, we sort of have to be everywhere. And, I mean, I'd like to ask Richard about this, but, uh, I mean, people in the State Department feel that really the United States is indispensable and that people should be everywhere, but I spent a, couple, a year in the State Department a few years ago, and what, one thing that struck me that was quite evident there was that the military is doing a lot of the diplomacy, right? Because the military is so present everywhere. You have CENTCOM and, you know, all these, all these military, you know, the aircraft carrier groups and so on all over the place, and they're actually doing a lot of the diplomacy replacing the State Department. So my State Department colleagues were kind of miffed, you know, because it's Pentagon people who are kind of meeting with the the foreign nations, delegations, and so on. But that's, you and, and know. I, I just want a tip for the rest of you. Uh, topic of my column in next Sunday's Boston Globe is exactly this, that the military has taken over the role formerly played by diplomacy. OK, Richard. What do you say? That's why he left. We have diplomats everywhere. <laughs> we have diplomats in places where the military are not. Uh, but the fact is the military have the money. And the military has constituencies, uh, the veterans groups, the arms guys, the congressmen. Uh, and when the president says, we got a problem, <coughs> the military are the ones that say, we can take care of that for you, sir. They got the funding, they got the people, they've got the support in the Congress to go try. And so consequently, there's this sort of growing phenomenon of the militarization of foreign policy. And instead of looking for diplomatic solutions, we look for the military to solve it. And, you know, say if all you got is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. 
I loved that line from uh, Secretary of Defense Gates to Hillary Clinton once when she was Secretary of State when he famously said, I've got more members of military bands than you have diplomats in the whole world. That really <laughs> illustrates the imbalance. But Gates has been one of the strongest supporters of building up a diplomatic and development system. I agree. That's, that's in fact, I think he was saying that almost regretfully as, as a way to try to redress it. Want to take one more? Um, yeah. Take one more, sure. Yeah. Um, what I still don't understand is like um, if this whole like war only benefits the U.S. like um, indirectly, and like the benefit they're gonna get from it is basically having an influence in Yemen. Like, is it really worth? all the lives that are, like, is that even something that is considered in the Congress? Like, okay, it does benefit the U.S., but is it really worth the lives? Like, it's not really about going around the U.N. and about these agreements. Like, they're there for a reason. But that is something I still don't understand. So I, I think people are going to think about that question now. I think they have not. I think members of Congress have not thought about whether this is really worth the lives or really whether it's really worth whether it's really in the U.S. interest. In part because we're kind of preoccupied with uh, Syria and Iraq and ISIS, right? And Yemen is just this little backwater somewhere down there south of Saudi Arabia. So I think people have not thought about it. I think now they will begin to think about it, and I think these issues will be will be on the agenda. hospital filled with people that is being bombed. Well, I'll tell you, there's an old cliche that says uh, where you stand depends a lot on where you sit. When you're in Washington, naturally you're subjected to all these pressures that we've been talking about from their various constituencies. They're worried about Iran, and we've got to be friends with Saudi Arabia for various reasons. So that's what you're seeing. You're not on the ground. I think if you were sitting there on the other end and looking at the world from the perspective of those who are receiving the results of American policy, your view might be quite different. And I think that sterile bubble in Washington does tend to isolate people psychologically from the reality of the, what the results are of their policies. Ah, on that happy note. <laughs> Thank you very much to both of our speakers. Okay. Thank you.